We good? Let's go. All right, Caleb, let's fire that first question, right? Tonight's question, tonight's comment, tonight's topic, right? Uh, why are Christian bodies called the temple of God? And I just kind of cleaned that question up because it was just a little bit more wordy. Uh, but we are going to be looking at, really, right? I think this is a great question. I know that maybe some might have thought this was way too simple or way too easy. Um, but, man, this question is something that should not only excite us, but it should really make our faith grow because if we don't truly realize the answer behind this, then we really don't understand or recognize the greatest asset that we have living on the inside of us. All right, come on. I'm going to tell you all tonight we got to be doing better than this at home Anthony, you'll check out here in a minute. Caleb, let Anthony know if people are amen and at home, right? So there better be a lot of feedback tonight on good stuff. But one of the greatest things, so what my plan is, is to walk through history really quickly, getting to the answer of this question, because I believe wholeheartedly that we have to go back to see how this started, which I believe most people know and understand of where that everything came from in the Old Testament, but I believe that it's so important. If you want to study a piece of history, Old Testament history, right? Study about the, the, the tent, the tabernacle, right? Where God dwelt before Christ came on the scene. It will make you appreciate what we're living this side of the cross. It's like, yeah, come on. Buck's on a delay, but that's okay. <laughs> Facebook will catch him up. <laughs> all right, so let's, let's go all the way back. First, first thing that I really want to talk about. All right, Caleb, come on, let's go. Here we go. Tent of meeting. I'm going to click when I do like this, Caleb. <laughs> As ten of meeting, all right? Does everybody remember this in the Old Testament? Does does everybody kind of have an idea of when this came on the scene? Exodus, right? All right, let's begin to flip our Bibles. If we got Bibles tonight, if you got one at home, get it get it out, right? Let's go. Exodus. Hold on. Genesis, Exodus, second book in the Bible. Let's go Exodus chapter 33. Is that right, Caleb? Yeah, praise the Lord. Now, let's get just a little bit of what's going on here in history, right? As God's people had been in bondage, in slavery, 400 years in Egypt, and Moses comes on the scene, and God uses him to deliver them out of slavery, uh, out of Egypt, and they go out into the wilderness, right? Before uh, anything crazy takes place, God goes up on the mountain. He gives Moses the Ten Commandments commandments all of these things are taking place and then we see all of this horrific things begin to unfold right but in the meeting of this right God establishes this tent the tent of meeting does anybody want to read that or you can read from your own translation or I'll read okay great Stop right there. Hold on, Caleb. That's good. All right. You got, you got a picture of this, right? This is one man going into the tent, right? He is the only one that had direct access to God. Key point, right? One man, Moses, 
God's spokesperson, God's chosen one, and he would go outside of the camp. And there's so much, so much goodness, right? We could preach a hundred messages on this, on this one thing tonight, right? Right? It's always amazing to think about that. Why wasn't it inside of the camp? Lots of great stuff. They, they weren't allowed to see God. <laughs> great point. Great points, great points. We're going to come back to it. Be thinking about that question, right? So then you've got to, you've got to, you've got to picture this as Moses, one guy walking by all of their tents, and them knowing he's heading to the tent of meeting, right? Because he's getting ready to talk to God. And you, can you imagine them just pulling back the tent just a little bit, their curtain on their tent, saying, "Oh my gracious, here comes Moses. He's going to talk to God." says that they, they watched him walk by to go to this tent where he could speak to the Lord. Go ahead, Ms. Sheila. When Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Oh my gracious. Right, just lots of great imagery here as we see Moses inside of the tent, each and every other person standing at their tent, worshiping God just because of the conversation that God was having with Moses. I just I just think about that in and of itself of how how overwhelming that 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 fact must have been to be able to stand and see this big huge pillar of cloud to know that God was in that cloud. It says it talked they talked face to face. Can you imagine how intimate that moment must have been and and how that that Moses must have felt let alone the people? It doesn't say that they came out of their tents. I think there's a lot in that, Joey. I think it's a great question. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think that's a loaded question. I think I think that we would probably. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that would be crazy. I never thought about it in those ways either, Joe. That's a good question. Mm. I think it's great. I'm going to ponder on that myself, Joe. Let me write that down. I say, hey, I got, I got you, old buddy. <laughs> yeah. Kimberly bought me new journals this week just for you. <laughs> <laughs> a little black book. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so we. <laughs> all right, come on, Joey. Me and you guys stay on the same page. Me and you, me and you, off track. All right. So once again, this is the start of what we see when it comes to God's relationship with man. This is the first way that we see it right now. God had been speaking. We know that he had been speaking different ways to different people up until this moment, right? But here we actually see God coming down and dwelling with his people. Right? This is the first instance that we begin to see this, this, this aspect of God. Now, of course, we know that he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. We can go with that. But this is outside of that, right, where we're starting to see this relationship being formed and how that it set up one man interceding on the behalf of everyone else. The tent of meeting, which leads us into the next place to where God uh, established that. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, little, lowercase g, little g's. Yes. Right, because of law, right, you, in, in the way that the law was set up, Levitical law, right, that anyone that was unclean would be outside of the camp, right, to purify yourself for that day's period, right, uh, what, how many ever days that it was before returning back to being clean, and man, it's such an imagery of what's going to take place with Christ, right, because they didn't crucify him inside the camp, they took him outside the city. Oh, man, I'm with <laughs> Quarantine. Absolutely. 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 So then we see the tabernacle, right, which is where that God is allowing this design to even grow even further, right, from the tent of meeting to the tabernacle to where that we're, we're starting to see out this elaborate plan being laid out to Moses and his people, right, uh, of, of this place for God to dwell. And we know if you've read any of Exodus, this is a detailed place. Right, specific links, right? Certain weights, different, certain, certain and specific materials that are used. It's used in this way. It's overlaid in this, right? All of this, not, right? Not just something ordinary. It didn't. God just didn't go out and say, "Hey, grab me a couple logs and throw up a building and I'll dwell." No, right? He he went to great links, right? Something so sacred for where he was going to dwell, it was a special place. Right? One set apart. Let's go to that next set of scriptures, Caleb. I hope I got those in there. Yeah, praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 40, right? And I know we're coming in on the back end of this one. This is right as we see the, uh, the tabernacle uh, erected and established. This is when God comes on the scene. Does anybody want to read here? All right, so for these 40 years of wandering around in the desert, right, God dwelt with his people. He dwelt with them in the tabernacle, and he would be so by day, right? And he would be hovering, setting upon, however you want to, filling the tabernacle. That's where he would be, and when the cloud was there, they would stay put and not journey. But as soon as his presence lifted, that cloud lifted, right, we know that they would set out on journey. Of course, we know this side of it, right, that they were simply just going around in circles, right, uh, uh, for 40 years. But they were being led by his presence in cloud during the day. And then at night, that same, that same cloud, right, would become this pillar of fire. So in both cases, right, God never leaving them by day, pillar of cloud, or by night, pillar of fire. His presence dwelling with them in the tabernacle, right? And now Moses not going into this when God dwelt there. Before, in the tent, right, Moses would come in and God would dwell and they would meet face to face. We're seeing a, a little bit different imagery now in the way that God is dwelling and he's staying with them all the time. But once again, we do see that it's in one place, one central location, God being at specifically 
in this tabernacle. Let's go on. Only access to a few people. Great, right? God's people, Jewish people then, right? Those people he was with during that time. Israelites. Good job, Caleb. That was impressive. Let's go. Let's look at now we're going to be looking at the actual temple. How many people know anything about the temple? Oh, boy. Come on, somebody. Solomon built it. Very expensive. We know that this came right through the Daviatic covenant and all this, right? We could get all theological tonight, right? This is big, big key words and terminology that we'll be looking at. But the temple, right? David is the first one that really got pressed upon his heart. He said, hey, wait a minute. I'm living in this big palace and God is dwelling in a tent. And Nathan said, go and do as your heart pleases, right? I'm paraphrasing. Come on, I won't get in trouble tonight. <laughs> second, second Samuel, is that where we're going, Caleb? Praise the Lord. Second Samuel, uh, chapter 6, chapter 7. <clears throat> What's really good about this is this is where we see where that this uh, being erected, right? This is where we see it being staying put. We know that Jerusalem were uh, uh, so much being taught, right? The Ark of the Covenant being brought there. We could, man, we could go on and on and on and on. But let's look at Second Samuel 7 through 1 through maybe verse 3. Is that what I got, Caleb? Okay, anybody want to read? All right. Here we see this new covenant with David uh, of establishing this great thing. Of course, we know that David is not the one that builds it. It's his son, Solomon, and Miss Karen doesn't chime in, right? We know that he, he's not the one that sees this plan through, but an extravagant, extravagant building uh, that Solomon lays out, one of great prestige and power to where now we see the Ark of the covenant we see so many different things that are carried out through uh, this this um, this temple and where God's presence really um, becomes now to where that mere more than just a, a, a certain group of people right to where all people are going to be having access to come and worship God which leads us into a couple prophets that I really want to talk about before we go too much further right Jeremiah and his covenant, I believe that it's well worth talking about before we go too much further. Jeremiah has given some great words to allow us to know of what's coming on the scene, of what, what's going to be promised, right? That it's not going to stay in the ways that they are worshiping now. There will be a day and a time to come for when God's people are, are truly going to experience what has been designed since the garden, right? God walking with his people, God being with his people at all times, not just some, not just the chosen, not just Jews, but but Gentiles alike. Jeremiah, Caleb, there we go. 31. There we go, right? Anybody want to read here? Jeremiah 31 through 34. Is that right, Caleb? You're supposed to tell me. Anybody want to read? Yeah. Stop. Right. So this is the covenant we just read about in the very first, right, with the tent. We know that when God told them, right, and gave them the covenant, the Ten Commandments, all those things, and they hadn't even got off the mountain, they'd already broke those covenants, right? This is exactly of what he's talking about. Thank you. That's okay. Don't worry about them.
Is that it, Caleb? I didn't put 34? Okay. Let's stop right there then. I thought I put 34. <laughs> it's okay. Is there one more, Caleb? Okay. Yeah. I believe Caleb messed that up. We'll, t we'll, we'll blame it on him. This, I'm just kidding. Let's go back to verse 33. Let's start back at verse 33, please, Caleb. <clears throat> All right, so with inside of this new covenant that Jeremiah is talking about, right, the weeping prophet, if you've never studied Jeremiah, check this dude out. Man, he really pleads on the behalf of God's people for sure. It says that uh, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. That very thing that we just talked about with the tent, those very things, right? The Ark of the Covenant, all God's laws being wrote, being placed inside of the, of the temple, all this stuff being commanded, taken, right, for only a few people to see. And Jeremiah says, hey, guess what? There's coming a day, God's telling, there's coming a day when I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people, no longer will you need a man in between. I will be in direct contact with my people. I am establishing a new covenant, a new day. Verse 34, Caleb. <laughs> Hold tight, Joey. Hold tight. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares. No longer will there be this boundary. No longer will there be only the priest, right, will be in direct contact or be speaking on behalf. God will know all, and all will know him. Hey. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Let's go on to Ezekiel. One more prophet here, and then we're going we're gonna to dive in here. Ezekiel's covenant, much like the same. Somebody jump in there and read. And anybody? I don't know what... It's usually. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will strike the clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in the statutes and be careful to obey my And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. All right, let's go back, Caleb. It's a great verse, right? Great verses that we could read. Let's go back, Caleb. Uh, go back two verses. 26, I think, is where I want to start at. Go back one more. Let's go 25, I lied. Yes, that's where I want to start, right there. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. Is that right? Is that how we say that? Huh? Uncleanlessness. I don't know. I, w I don't know how you say that. I, I, yeah, come on. You say it how you want to, and I'm going to say it how I want to. <coughs> I will sprinkle clean water on you. Man, I, I love this. If you go back and look Old Testament and what they used to sprinkle on you during a service, right? Moses would take the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it on the people. To atone for their sins, he would take an animal and sacrifice it here on this altar and he would take that blood and then he would sprinkle it on the people. We're going to do that next Sunday and see how many more of you show back up. Call it the holy blood. <laughs> I'm not coming back to a service where they sprinkle me in blood, maybe. Can you? I, I, I know, right? 
I know, I know, I know it's hard, right? But I mean, you just just think about that. Oh my gracious, it's an overwhelming point to say, hey, praise the Lord, we're not living on that side of that covenant any longer, right? He says, hey, I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water, right? And it, you will be clean from all of your dirtiness, <laughs> right? From all of your idols, I will cleanse you. Caleb, there you go. And I will give you this new heart and a new spirit that I will put within you and I will remove that heart of stone. Do we not see that being talked about throughout all of the Old Testament, right? This heart of stone to where that uh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We, we see several instances where this heart of stone and then it carries over into the New Testament as well from this heart, right? Where God is going to basically circumcise our heart, heart transplant. That's where all this terminology is coming from. He's going to give us a heart of flesh, Right? Something that he can work with, something that he can mow. We use the terminology, your heart being softened. Just like the potter and the clay. Next verse, Caleb. Right? And I will put my spirit, key terminology, God saying, I am going to deposit inside of you, impute, right? A deposit and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. He's saying, this is what's going to happen. I am going to place my spirit on the inside of you. Never before, right? Even, even in the garden when, when God was walking with them and, you know, and it says that God was hovering over and all those different things, never this concept of actually God's Spirit being talked about put into men until we see here this covenant of what's going to take place, which leads us to the greatest covenant. Let's go. Uh, yeah, come on. Let's go on to the next one. Please, sir. Yeah, next next slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey! That's, a, that's okay, honey. You don't have to get out. Just... Great job. Which brings us to the Jesus covenant, right? the greatest covenant known, right? Everything that has been talked about, all the prophecy for thousands of years, right? The whole entire Old Testament leading up and pointing us to this one man, Jesus, right? The Messiah, the King of Kings, right? Lord of Lords, which brings us to one verse that's not going to do this covenant justice, but it's where this question has brought us to, Anybody know where we're going? Don't show it yet, Caleb. Anybody know where we're going? Anybody want to guess? Anybody? That's a great one. I was going to put that in there, but we're not, but that's great. She said John chapter 2. Uh, she's already cheating. I see their phone lit up back here. <laughs> Just be honest. <laughs> Just be all right, that's where we're going. First Corinthians 6 is where we're going. If you want to turn your Bibles there, I think it's great. Once again, I like to put this out. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, we would love to give you one. First Corinthians chapter 6. Now let's make sure before we get right here, 6, 19, and 20 is what we're going to be talking about. We've got to have a little bit of background here. This is the Apostle Paul. He's talking here of to a pretty unruly church, right? And they are dealing with some crazy things, right? PG version. There are some people, mainly women prostitutes, that are deciding that, hey, we'll make the temple a place where we just go and do our business, all right, lots of lots of wrongful sexual things going on inside of the church, 
And Paul is saying, hey, wait a minute. We need to address this. This is where this verse is coming out of. It's talking about sexual sin. Oh, my gracious, right? So we, we need to see that because we could go back and read so much more. But we're going to read these last two verses that I hope will help us out just a little bit. Anybody want to read here? Oh my gracious. So let's let's go back because there's so much that I wanna I wanna grab out of here. That's verse nineteen, Caleb. Back back up, please, sir. So let's look at lots of statements here that tie up hopefully of what we're gonna be doing. Christian body being the temple of God, the Apostle Paul bringing out this huge point right in the midst of sexual sin because there is so much that takes place inside of sexual sin that I know we don't have time to go on tonight about, right? We'll put that in the hat and talk a lot about that some other time. But lots of issues that come up. It's the reason why that the enemy is using it so well in the world today. It's the reason why it's a 40 plus billion dollar. And I, come on, I can't even get into why, right? Well, it's, it's, it's why it's so uncomfortable. Yeah. Kids. Great point. I mean, because the devil can keep parents from even talking about it with their kids until something happens. Right. You know, you're not, you're not educated, you know. And, and that's, that's tough. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And I think that's what we're going to have to absolutely absolutely and, there, and there's so much that that's that that's taking place here and God it and God uh, is using Paul to even write this because the enemy is just making a mockery of the church even of the world right we're experiencing this very thing right now that's taking place as we see sexual sin being so rampant and not just rampant right it's being accepted as the norm Come on, right? It's it's not even that 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 we're trying to cover it up, we're trying to shun it, we're trying to to, to disprove it, right? We as a society are saying if it's if you like it, it's okay, do it. Oh, absolutely, right? All of it being tied, all of it being tied together. And here is Paul saying, "Hey, don't you know, right? Don't you know that your body is the temple?" of of the Holy Spirit, right? Because in the verse back before, he's saying, are you saying that Christ is being joined with a, a prostitute? Are they becoming one flesh? Are you saying that's possible? Right? You're saying, hey, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? This is exactly what was promised from Jeremiah, from Ezekiel, right? These prophets, God's wording, I will put my spirit inside of you. No longer will you have to go to a temple. No longer will you have to go to a specific place of worship. No longer will you need one man, one man, yes, that has paid the wave. But once you accept that one man, you will be deposited God's spirit inside of you living on the inside of you your body being this temple it's what people were peeking outside of their tents longing for to see God dwell and right now he's dwelling inside of you it's the, it's the greatest thing that tonight you didn't have to come here to experience God you can experience God at home but here's what you're getting a whole bunch of God right now He's dwelling on the inside of you and on the inside of me. And we're coming together to say, hey, guess what? It's like a bunch of atoms, not atoms, A-D-A-M-S. Come on, spell it out, A-T-O-M-S. Carrie, is that right? Praise the Lord. My spelling's terrible, so I'm glad I got one thing right today. Right? All of those molecules, all those things coming together, that's, that's what we see in vision tonight, us being many members of one body, the body of Christ. God dwelling on the inside of us. Go ahead, uh, enjoy. Since it says that in the Bible that you are God. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We can twist it any way you want to. Great, great point. Whom you have from God. Key terminology. 
right? Paul is making sure that we understand that we've been given God from himself. It's a gift. You are not your own. Yes, you have, you're a gift even of, in and of yourself. But God's given you a greater gift, himself, that's placed on the inside of you so that you can give that gift away. Oh, my gracious, right? It's, it's, it's so overwhelming. Let's go. Verse 20, Caleb. For you were bought with a price. The highest price ever. His son. His one and only son to do what? To glorify God in your body. And that's, and that's more than loaded, right? Because this is where we see the extremists, right, that take it to say that we have to be completely ripped and not eat anything. And, right, we, we begin to make our body an actual temple in and of itself to the point that we're worshiping our body. It's not God's, not God's point here. Do believe that you should take care of yourself, not be Vienna sausages at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, right? <laughs> <laughs> one can ain't going it's just you gotta you gotta eat it eat in moderation right just like everything else moderation right sure he wants us to take care of our bodies right i i, I love uh, i love john piper i listened to an interview on him today and he said one of the greatest things that his mother told him hey don't be out smoking or drinking because your body is housing the temple right your, your body's the temple of god and he said i can remember as a teenager going through those those crazy times that man i didn't want to be putting smoke or alcohol in my body because i knew what was on the inside of there and we look at it in those terms. Sure, we think about the, the smoking and the drinking, but what about the five plates at the buffet? And we ain't got no buffets right now, I know. Come on, right? I know that's disheartening. I know there's a lot of people down about the buffet. We can't get there. But we, we, don't, we don't think about in those terms all the time that God is asking us to take care of our bodies, and we can. We can go as far left or right as we want to to where that we say, hey, we don't have to exercise to where we running the wheels off the, off the elliptical or whatever, right? But God wants us to take care of what he's given us because it was bought with a steep price, the greatest price. It's what makes the offering, the sacrificial offering system so important. When we go back and look at that when people were coming and giving the offering, when they started giving all these lame animals and buying some cheap bird, it didn't cost them anything. It wasn't their sacrifice, but when he said, give of your first fruits and give of the best, it hurts. That's what it's calling of our lives, right? Not, not to give our leftovers, right? If we come and, and, and we give what's left over off our check this week after we paid everything, and that's a measly couple bucks, and a couple bucks, they don't have nothing to do with it. If we're not giving what's first, what God is owed, then we ought not just give anything. Oh, man. I know, right? Miss Joan will be killing me. Come on, Miss Joan. I'm not telling people not to tithe. Come on. She'll be giving me, she'll be typing in. I'm saying that our hearts and our motives is what it's all about. We have to, we have to look at it in this instance, right? It's what has to call, it's what we have to realize that it costs us so much more. That Christ's life is what paid for our lives so that one thing can happen. Not so that we can walk around and say, look at me. I've got God living on the inside of me. It's saying, hey, look at me because I've got God living on the inside of me. And look at what he's doing in and through me so that God gets the glory. It's the reason why we share what we share. I hear lots of people saying all the time, do we really think that we need to talk about what God's doing so much? Absolutely. We need to point all of it back. If we're saying, hey, look at Bethlehem, look at what we're doing so that we're getting the praise, it's absolutely the wrong thing. We're saying, look at what God's doing so that God gets the glory. That's the reason why we're housing his spirit, right? It's a great perk for us. Not only is he living on the inside to encourage us, to comfort us, to help us, right? To keep us going through every situation. God's given us the greatest resource that people long to see by peeping through a tent, right? 
I kind of think about the old days when people used to peep through their blinds to see what was going on outside. And it comes back to your verse this morning. Yeah. This was even free Holy Spirit coming on this. Yeah. You know, I mean, God's trying to prepare them. You know, your good works to give God the glory. You know, give the Father the glory that's in heaven. But it's even free. You know, that Holy Spirit Good point. in you is, is you know, I've, I've listened to countless messages the last couple of weeks on that Holy Spirit living within you versus beside you. Yeah. He was beside them for so long, you know, in that cloud, in a prophet, in, right. you know, somebody. Great point. In you, instead of beside you, changes the whole ballgame. I mean, it's a whole ball game. God is to like walk through the Red Sea and then immediately got on the other side and said, I don't want to eat you. Right. Start. And we're, you know what you just walked through? But they didn't have the power inside of them working. They didn't have God inside of them. Yeah. Great. You know? Great point. I got to say, God didn't surprise anybody. He told everybody exactly what he was going to do. I mean, everybody. And the, and the thing about it is, is that we're, we're living on the on the on the inside on the outside of it right now. We we already know how. Excuse me. Every bit of this plays out. These people are walking through it in real time, right? And they're and they're hearing and they're experiencing and they're 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 not just not just hearing about it in a little bit, right? These people were, were were taught this from from their birth all the way until right until the end of their existence. Right from them taking their last breath this side, right? They 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 were taught about what God was going to do, and then Jesus comes on the scene, and it is so hard for them to believe that this man is actually going to be who that he's going to be to fulfill everything that he's going to fulfill. And then when guess what? When Christ goes back to the Father and Pentecost happens, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow, right? Their eyes are open to so much. The comforter is there, right? God's presence himself is there. And it's like just taking that match and throwing it on a big pile of, 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 of wet wood with gasoline, right? I mean, it just, whoo, and they are impacted so greatly. And guess what? We don't have to wait for Peter to preach that message. At the moment we say yes to Christ, that same spark is there. At the moment we say yes to Christ. And here's the greatest part. It happens every time we say yes to Christ. That's what jacks me up, right? Is that every time that I'm obedient, I instantly get that adrenaline rush, the best drug that I've ever taken, God's spirit inside of me. And I'm surprised saying, I can't believe that you're doing this, God, and you're using somebody like me. But every time, every time, every time. Now, sure, I don't have that mountaintop experience every time when I just like today when you get hate mail and you think, hey, wait a minute. I get that. But at the end of the day, when we're obedient to Christ, that's why Paul says, work out your own salvation. Every day, every time. He says, be renewed. When you are, when you're obedient, Man, your faith not only increases, but that spirit is growing, right? It's not that you have to keep getting baptized by the Holy Spirit so that you can speak in tongues and smack people in the head, right? You get filled with the spirit because you're being obedient to the spirit. That's what's growing, right? It's just like the more that you put in the belly, the bigger that it gets. Come on. Wake up. Come on, right? Right? It grows. Absolutely. And, and you're so much more in to hearing it. I'm sorry about the belly joke. I'm, that's, I'm, mine's grown this week. You know, it's exactly of what God is saying and those convictions. You know, because I think your conviction yeah. is with that Holy Spirit so that you interpret and you understand so much clearer. You know? Like you're giving all that at one time. Yes. Great point. That that's right, and that's what. Right. Great point. That's a good question. Somebody ought to put that in there. So that is that that. Let me let me rephrase that because I know somebody's going to say they didn't hear uh they didn't hear it online. So I'll make sure you hear this right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I know who said it. 
Give me a minute. I'm just wording what she said. She talked 700 words in less than 30 seconds right there. <laughs> you know how fast she just talked? Did y'all not just hear what I heard? I know. She's got to get it in quick. You can't blame that. She was doing that pre-Bobby Joe. Yeah. All right. So the question was, and it wasn't a question. It was a statement. Right. Upon receiving Christ, right, are, are we given, right, the full measure? Or are we receiving all of what God and his spirit at that moment? And then, right, as we continue to grow in our relationship, right, that, that, that our faith increases, right? Because there's several denominations that believe, okay, you receive part Part, part A of God at salvation, and then once you complete this part, then you receive part B, right? You can be baptized in this, right? And you can continue, and not that there's not terminology directly from the Bible uh, that we can, we can take. I think it's a great question. We may have to have that wrote down. I, here's what I believe, right? I believe according to God, just the way that the Apostle Paul says it, I believe that we are given every bit of God the moment we say yes, the moment we surrender our lives, I believe that God deposits his spirit, right? We, now, what I also believe is, is that every time that we do say yes, every time that we are obedient, every time that we are allowing God to work in and through us, our faith is growing and his spirit is becoming more active more active, right? Because here's what we like to do, even though his spirit's on the inside of us, we want to control his spirit, right? We want to fight, right? Our, our flesh is saying, but wait a minute, God, I think we ought to do this. And when we do that, we, we're putting hands on the spirit, right? It's called quenching the spirit. Even in our disobedience, like when some of you, some of you every week, God's saying you need to do this. And you say, but wait a minute, God, do I really need to do that? And you're doing this right here. Do I need to look at you directly in your eyes tonight, those of you who are doing that? Don't do that. You're making my job harder. Be obedient. Say yes. Do it. And then we can all just hoop and holler. Well, Kyle, it's just like your mustard seed. Yeah, come on. You know, everything that plant is going to ever be in that seed. Great point. Yeah, great point. But it's all in that seed. It's all in that little bitty, little bitty, little bitty seed, right? But the same plant is there. That's a great point. So how long do you wait before you start giving the seeds away? Like it takes so long for tobacco plants to grow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I get. I, get, I see where you're going with that. Immediately. So Joey's question was, should we, should we wait in any time right after we, when we say yes, is there a time limit before we start sharing with what we've got? Joey, I love your questions. I love them. I, really I don't want to cross priests. Like, I'm more, I would feel more comfortable giving my testimony than I would trying to give facts from the Bible. Then do that. That's what I do. I know. <laughs> you don't have to preach a sermon. Right. You don't have to stand up and say, I know everything about this. Here's what you are required to say. What God has done for Joey. Yes. And at the moment you say yes, that's your testimony. That's your testimony, point blank. Every time, that's all of us, right? God's not calling every one of us to be this right here, right? We're not all mouthpieces, right? Some are arms, some are legs, some are ears, some are noses, right? All different parts of the body. God's, God's wanting us, each and every one of us, to be obedient. Just thankfully that we don't have to wait for God to show up at the other end of the cemetery and we got to wait for one guy to walk down there and talk to him and then come back and tell us what we're supposed to do. We've got what we're supposed to do. We know every detail of what we're supposed to be doing and we've got God on the inside of us to help us do it. We have absolutely no excuse. That's not what we wanted to hear tonight, I know. But God is putting us all in comfortable environments, really, yeah. because of what we love yeah. to do and what we're doing. Yeah, great point. We can speak to people, you know, give a table we're learning. Great point. Discipleship, you know, from right now. And 
and then just apply it right into your everyday work. You know? Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great points, right? He's, he's, he's not putting us environments that we talked about last week with a persecuted church to where that if you say that I'm a follower of Christ, that your parents are going to throw you out of their home, right? And not just throw you out of their home, they're going to throw you out of their village and then you have absolutely nothing or you're going to be beheaded or stabbed or killed or burnt alive, right? I read some crazy, I, we can't even get into that tonight. I can't go there. But you still may Absolutely. You're definitely going to re- meet resistance, right? It may be not to that extreme persecution, but we all have issues with inside of family and friends or whether we're made fun of or whether we look down. We talked about three topics this morning that I guarantee if you go to your workplace or you talk to family or friends about those three, there are going to be some people that ain't going to agree with what God's word says. And guess what they're going to call themselves? Christians. Oh, my gracious. We got real tonight. True statement, right? But God's calling us. It's the reason why that he struck people dead immediately when they committed sin in the Old Testament because he tried to keep this bloodline, his, his law, he tried to keep everything as pure as he possibly could. He wanted people to see how serious that he was. And it's not that he still doesn't do that now. We just call them heart attacks, strokes. I'm not saying that, every, come on, I know I'm going to get some hate mail on that. I'm not saying that everybody has a heart attack or stroke sinned. Please don't take it that way. I'm just saying we've got medical terms for everything now. It went through God's hand. He decided when you took your last breath or when you're going to take your last breath. We're just going to put some medical term that we paid somebody a lot of money to tell us what it was on the end of it. That's it. That's it. I got to stop because I'm going to dig myself in a grave tonight. Here we go. <laughs> we are living in the best times that we possibly ever could, even though everything around us looks like hell. Come on. We are living in the best times. We have God living on the inside of us, and we know how this thing ends, regardless of what happens in the next four years or if we live another four minutes. We've got Christ living on the inside of us who promises us the greatest thing that's ever been promised, eternal life with God. And it's paid for. We don't have to do anything other than surrender our lives, making our will And if you ain't done that, come on, do it. What are you waiting on? And if you've done it one time or you've done it a hundred times, do it every day. Take it up every day. Your cross, follow him. I got to stop. Come on. Somebody else. I told y'all we were going to preach tonight. That's good stuff. I don't know how that you can't get, get excited about that without knowing, right, where we've come from. Yep. Yes. Great point. It's really hard for us to understand sometimes of really that, that power living on the inside of us because that's the, that's the same power that raised Christ from the grave. That same supernatural power is living on the inside of us. It's why that Christ even told his disciples, you're going to do greater things than even I've done. And I don't know if you know it, but Christ done some pretty cool stuff. He picked up a guy's ear and put it on the side of his head. He called a dead guy from four days right out of the tomb and said, hey, take off those grave clothes. <laughs> Blind man from birth. Deaf to speak just by spitting. Come on. I mean, he done some pretty cool stuff. And he says, you'll do greater we're seeing that every time a person says yes to Christ, we're seeing someone dead. We're seeing something greater than what Christ did when he was there. We're seeing someone being born into forever existence with Christ. I'm telling you, that ought to jack you up tonight. I'm going to go right across the top. Look out, Aunt Jean. I may run those pews. I'm going to split you and Big D <laughs> right in between you as I run the top of them. That's powerful. I'm telling you, that ought, to just, that ought to just jack you up. Who's going to draw tonight? Come on. Who wants to do it tonight? Who's up? I mean, here comes Kendall. She's coming down the outside. Look at here. Look at here coming down the outside. 
Do you want to dance? Would you like to dance? You want to dance? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Here we go. Our churches, parentheses, organizations, essential. Here we go. Our churches, parentheses, organizations, essential. Great question. <laughs> what do you say? Jo Joey's done answered it. All right, let's draw again. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. Hey, well, start doing your research. You know where we're going. Where are we going? <laughs> That's it. We're going. Questions, comments, concerns. Great stuff. Great stuff. Great stuff. Appreciate you all praying for this week, right? Blessed week for lots of, for all of us, right? I hope, as well as lots of prayer requests, lots of things going on this week. We'll pray specifically for those. We are going to pray specifically for Gary uh, Spalding as well tonight. Anybody else want to pray for specifically? School, we're still doing hybrid. Oh, my gracious. Can't say nothing bad because we're still alive. Anthony's done giving me the dirty look. Just kidding. Pray for the schools, right? Superintendent, everybody's making lots of decisions about lots of kids. Is there a right answer? I don't know. I don't think there is, right? You just got to make one and just pray that the Lord takes care of it. Anybody else? Come on, let's stand. I'm already past time. Lord, we do come to you just thanking you for tonight, thanking you for your words, Lord. Thanking you as we, we did just take a, a walk down uh, memory lane as we, we looked at how that, um, uh, not, not the way that, that you wanted it, Lord, but the way that things were set up and established for the tent and for the tabernacle and the temple and the way that, that you set up showing of how, 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 how separated we were without you, Lord, how that so many things had to be in a certain way until Jesus came on the scene, how that he decided to leave heaven, all of his glory, all of his majesty to become just like us and then not coming to just simply rule and reign, but to come to give his life as a ransom, paying the ultimate price, paying a price that we should have paid for the sin in our life with him being completely just perfect. And Lord, we, we thank you for that because we, we know that he, he didn't stay dead, that he rose from that grave and that now he's sitting right beside you on his throne waiting for the appropriate time for you to, to send him back, God coming for his church, Lord, and him sending his Holy Spirit to, to comfort us, to guide us, to direct us, and in the meantime, Lord, so I, I just thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for, for having you just being on the, the inside of me, knowing that, that I can't imagine taking a, another day, another step in the way that I once was, all by myself, alone, trying to do what I thought was best, thanking you for, Lord, you leading, for you guiding, for you directing, not just me, for every believer. That right now you're you're interceding, not 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 just aimlessly, Lord. You're doing what's best. And I, and I just pray, Lord, I pray that we, we realize this great privilege that we have, that you're living uh, on the inside of us. And I, and I just pray as we, we leave out, Lord, that just as we talked this morning, that, that more and more people will begin to see that you are there. And they won't, they won't look to it anywhere else, Lord. They'll look to us to see you right on the inside of us. So I, I do pray. I pray for the, the days ahead. I pray for our week that you would just, uh, just schedule those divine appointments for us to share of who that you are, of what, what you've done in our lives, Lord, that you would put people right in our paths that we could minister to. 
And I do pray specifically for Gary, uh, and I pray, Lord, for his back. I know that he has been going through some extreme pain and even hoping and praying that this surgery would do something, Lord. So we're going to continue to trust you. You're going to continue just to lift him up to you, that you would heal his body. And if you, you want to continue to use some type of medical procedure, then, Lord, we know that you're orchestrating that doctor or surgeon's hand, Lord. But if you want to go ahead and just do what only you can do, then, Lord, we're, we know that you don't need our approval, Lord. We just say go ahead, and we're going to come right along beside you in agreement, Lord. Then we'll, we'll continue to praise you of however this plays out. But we're trusting his back with you, so just be with him and, and uh, Lou. Man, Lord, continue to be with all of these prayer requests. So much going on in and around our world, in our country right now, Lord. We need to be the church, Lord, that's unified to just do a great and mighty work, Lord, through this divided country. And I, I just pray, I pray that you'll allow us to be this light. So give us safe travels as we leave out of here. And we can't thank you enough for all of our blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.